thank you all very much for coming here for this talk. And um, today, as it's said on the program, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the conscious sun. Um, I'll also go get into light a little bit, since that's the main product of the conscious sun, and then a little bit on consciousness, because conscious is consciousness. A um, little bit about food, because that's where I started all out, and everything is connected as we know. And a little bit about chaos theory also, because that's quite key to everything. And there may be a little bit about um, a few other things as well as they come to mind. Um, but yeah, I started off many years ago with natural foods. And, and there was one thing about introducing natural foods to people in this country in 1968 was that when you told people that what you ate affected your health and your well-being, you got a strange look. It was, what? Is this, where's this guy coming from? And then when you told him you, you, that you ate things like seaweed in your diet, you really got, you know, they walked away. Um, and the same with the sun. You know, I tell people, yeah, I think the sun thinks. And you get that same sort of strange looks. And I like strange looks. They sort of give me motivation to go on because there's obviously work to be done when you get that response from people. Um, so I spent quite a few years selling introducing things like brown rice and sesame seeds and miso and then um, after 15 years of working with that I um, well I got tired of trying to sell a pound of beans in a bag cheaper than somebody else so I came up with this brand new product that was going to be um, different and that was the veggie burger which was the first vegetarian burger that ever came out and again it was strange looks there was no market for vegetarian food products um, when I approached supermarkets with it, they would half the time say, well, let's see, who's the buyer for this? We'll give you the meat buyer. And of course, the guy in charge of the meat department, they were never terribly excited about putting a veggie burger. It was like a cancer in their, in their food section. But, um, but I got into Sainsbury's and they did well, and it, it, it eventually the word entered the language. It was part of the English language, even though I had trademarked it at the time. So. Um, so that was the sort of the food thing, and I, I, I left food after a while because I just, well, I sold the veggie burger and I thought, well, that's, that's it for sort of buying things and putting them in bags or mixing them together and selling them. And I took a couple years sort of advance on retirement, and then I discovered chaos theory. And chaos theory was this sort of fantastic new thing that showed how everything was connected and how everything affected everything else and um, the connection is, is a really important part of it important part of it because so much of the the technology and the science that we have seems to be devoted to protecting us from our environment protecting us from the world around us whether it's with air conditioning and heating and enclosed structures or whether it's with pills that you take when you've been eating all the sort of disconnected food, you take a pill to connect you with vitamins or minerals or things in it. And um, chaos theory showed us how these things were connected. And it was just this wonderful discovery that, well, scientists were, were looking at how a rainforest held together. And you've got all these different elements in a rainforest. You've got frogs and trees and the weather and rivers and snakes and jaguars and countless other inhabitants and they all work together to create this structure that is stable harmonious where everybody's got their food I and mean, sometimes their food is some other part of the of the of the network but it's a harmonious structure and um that's the sort of science that we really need that recognizes that, that sees also how outside of something living like a rainforest, you can have a weather system. And in that weather system, you've got moisture and air pressure and wind and the rays from the sun. And you create a system with clouds and regular currents and winds that come up every spring and this incredible order that is arising out of inanimate objects. And how is this going on? Well, the scientists studying chaos theory recognized it was going on. They didn't really try and figure out how this sort of stuff happens. Um, and what really got me interested in chaos theory was this natural self-organization of systems. Because in our society, we have the top-down approach where 
it's assumed that to have organization you have to have this sort of direction from the top telling you you know what you can eat what's safe what's a real house how many hours of work a week you can work how you're going to get paid for that and it's this sort of ever and ever more fine-tuned control of the system which is destroying the possibility of us developing our own natural system, the sort of system that a rainforest or a weather system has when you've got millions or billions of people working together, you have stable things coming out of that when you let it work. And in my first book, Uncommon Sense, I highlight that and I show how where you have got actual freedom still, like in the music industry or in the shoe industry, or, you know, I could pick loads of examples, but you get this sort of development of music where everybody's got something that they like listening to. And if they don't, they can make their own music. And nobody's going to come and say, hey, well, most of the world, nobody's going to come and say, hey, you can't listen to that, that's illegal, you have to listen to, to Bach or the Beatles or, you know, something established. Whereas we have that in, in many aspects of our lives. If you're ill in America and you want health treatment, you have to go to this sort of a treatment. Most you know, alternative practices are either banned or you have to spend six years in medical school to, to touch somebody with your hands on a healing basis. Um, so that's the sort of top-down versus bottom-up organization and a lot of that came into the book, my book Son of God, as I was working on it to see how how that bottom-up achieves things, and uh, it's the same bottom-up as a termite mound where you've got millions of termites, there's no queen, no king of a termite mound, and yet somehow they create this incredibly perfectly air-conditioned, ventilated home within which they live. So I'll sort of you know, start warming up to the topic at hand, to the sun, um, and just point out that, first of all, that you know, we have, we've had speakers today on the Mayan calendar and, you know, we've got great interest in this calendar that tracks events back tens of thousands of years and, and the Mayan prophecies and it ex excites a lot of interest with us today and we also have a lot of interest in the Egyptian culture and I mean that's been going back for many, many decades and analyzing, looking at the pyramids, how they were built how their layout the plot, you know, corresponds with the cosmology, what stars, shafts of the pyramids we're pointing at. There's lots of interest in that. Um, we also have interest in our Celtic culture in this country, and you know, tens of thousands of people go to Stonehenge to celebrate the summer solstice every year, this wonderful occasion. Um, we respect the Greeks as the people who sort of very the first civilization with democratic approach and uh, a lot of science that was developed in Greek culture which is actually was destroyed by the early Christians and some of it was retained, Islam retained some of it and then it trickled back to the West in the sort of 14th, 15th century and, and the Renaissance arose as a result of Greek culture. So we appreciate all of these things but we tend to ignore the one common thread that ran through the Mayans, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Celts, as well as the Norse, the North American Indians, the Aztecs, the Incas, um, the Sumerians, the Persians. All of these ancient cultures realized one thing, which was that the sun was a living being. It was just common currency to all of those cultures and to, to everybody. It was just natural. and. Um, after spending seven years working on the book Son of God, what amazes me most of all isn't that stars are conscious living beings, which is pretty fucking amazing, but that we have lost that from our culture. That somehow this intuitive, natural understanding that once spread across the planet has been completely excised from our culture. And when you look at spiritual forums, there's almost nothing in there about the sun, when you sort of tick the box on what your religion you are on a, on a form of some for, sort, there's nothing about the sun on that form, and yet this was once, sun was once the most widespread 
well-recognized deity on this whole planet. Um, and how did this, you know, how did we lose this? And um, I was on a radio program a few, a couple of months ago, actually, and I was asked, well, isn't, isn't sun worship, or weren't they just being primitive and ignorant, these old cultures? And asked the question, well, who says that was primitive and ignorant? Was it science? And no, it wasn't. There's absolutely nothing in science that, that has, that bears or, or addresses the consciousness of the sun. And if you were to explain to a Mayan or an Egyptian, a holy man or sun priest, if you were to explain to them what's going on in the sun, the different layers of the sun, which we'll come to later, and the way it spins and the way it sends out a sort of protective shield that, that encompasses the whole solar system, their jaws would drop and they'd actually go away with that much more respect for the deity they chose to, to, to recognize. Um, and it was, a, it was religion, and it was a very jealous church that told us sun worship is primitive and ignorant because this was very much their main competitor. And they wanted people to come inside, shut their eyes, and look at the floor, and commune with a god, and then pay tithes for it. And they, the alternative to this was a lifetime of damnation in hell, or being burnt at the stake on, on earth for having those sorts of thoughts. And I mean, it's hard to emphasize, you know, I will try to emphasize how, how they went about this and how successful it was. And, we know about the Crusades when Christians would would be, you know, do-gooders went out to the Middle East and waged war against all these errant Muslims who were taking over the Holy Land. But we don't often hear about the, you know, one of the successful Crusades, which was the Albigensian Crusade, and this was in the 13th century. And this went on for 20 years, and it wasn't waged against Muslims in the Middle East. It was waged against Christians in the south of France, the Cathars, which was a, a very large religion, very successful religion, a Christian religion, which you've probably uh, heard about before in one place or another. And um, they incorporated various non-acceptable things into their creed. And they incorporated sun gazing, they recognized the sun as a worthy of respect. Um, Women were free, they didn't have to get married if they wanted to have sex and have children. You know, they didn't toe the Christian line. And the Albigensian Crusade spent 20 years wiping out every trace of the Cathars they were. And their main, their main city was Beziers, which had 30,000 inhabitants. And when the Crusaders army finally broke through into Beziers, they, 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 it had been under siege for years, um, they asked their papal envoy, well, what should we do? Because half of the population of Beziers was Christian and half were Cathars, and they lived very happily together. Um, how do we tell the Christians from the Cathars? And the papal envoy said, kill them all. God will recognize his own. And that was, that was his solution to it. Um, and then 300 years later... Did they do that? Yeah, they did. They went in and then they killed every single one of the 30,000 men, women, and children living in Beziers. And after they continued, because of a 20-year campaign, to clean up the Cathars, they, they, those few remaining Cathars who survived this had fled to the hills and the mountains to, to escape certain death. And the Vatican set up the Inquisition. And the original purpose of the Inquisition was to wipe out every last trace of these Christians who incorporated sun worship into their into their practice, and then when they ran out of Cathars, they started to they went to Spain and persecuted Jews who posed as Christians. And as the, as these government institutions do, they they always want more work. Um, Giordano Bruno, 300 years later, was this fantastic Italian astronomer philosopher. And he was born after Copernicus, and Copernicus, as you probably know, was the <coughs> first person to recognize that the Earth did not rotate, sorry, that the Sun didn't rotate around the Earth, because up till Copernicus, the Earth was considered to be the center of the universe, and everything turned around us, because that's what it looks like. 
And there's a very complicated model to explain why these things called planets moved in different directions. Well, Copernicus figured it out, and he died right after his book was published, so he didn't get into trouble for it. Um, Giordano Bruno was a monk in Italy, and he got a copy of Copernicus' book, and it got him going, and he took it further. Um, he fled his monastery because he was having heretical thoughts. He knew that would get him into trouble. And he, he recognized that not only did the universe not circle the, the earth, but that the sun, it, but that the sun was just another star, because all the Copernicus and Galileo after him thought the whole universe re rotated around the sun. And Bruno realized that the sun was just another star, and that he also recognized that stars were alive, living beings, um, worthy of worship, and he didn't believe in the virgin birth and a few other things. And the, he, he wrote books, he traveled around Europe lecturing about this, and the Vatican was quite upset about this, and they sent an agent from the Inquisition out who lured him to Italy. He said, come on back, I want to publish your books in Italy, this is great stuff. And his first night in his host's house, the Inquisition took him away and um, interrogated him, and he very sort of, patiently tried to explain to his interrogators why why the star was another sign and the, the logic of his beliefs um, and he was not successful they put him in jail for seven years they took him out again uh, they tortured him he still wouldn't recount and he still held to his beliefs and Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake um, as the only way to deal with his character and when he was sentenced to be burned at the stake, his reply to the judges was, perhaps you, my judges, pronounce this sentence against me with greater fear than I who receive it. Um, and then when he was burned, they tied his tongue before they lit the fire, lest he try to spread any of his inflammatory ideas to the crowd that were assembled at the time. Um, so the church, well, they had a reason you know, we know why they, why they didn't want people to worship the sun, it was a competition. Scientists, though, are just upholding this old church taboo. Scientists used to be able to study spirit. As we know, most astronomers were also astrologers. And this was quite acceptable, but the church came in in the sort of Middle Ages and said, no, anything that is a cult is a no-no. You don't study that. And scientists now, they diss the church but they still follow its instructions. They still, if a scientist starts to look into astrology or homeopathy or a living stars, they're immediately sort of taken down. They lose their funding. They're, they're burned, figuratively speaking, because their scientific career is over. You don't do that sort of thing. Um, so conscious sun, you know, what is consciousness? I'm not going to give you a straight answer. People have written whole books about it, and people have summed it up in two words. Consciousness is. It's just a, it exists. It's like gravity. And um, yes, scientists have this idea that consciousness is exclusive to human beings, that in this sort of universe that started 13,700 million years ago, it got up to two million years ago, and suddenly human beings came out of the trees, started reflecting on their lives, and consciousness developed. Um, it's a little bit of arrogant to assume that it's never been here up until that point. And is it something that just develops when you've got the right amount of neurons in the brain, and you've got skin with the touches, and you've got eyes and ears, and suddenly you put all these things together, and ergo you have consciousness, or is consciousness well, are those brain, are those brain cells and eyes and nerves? Are they the things that, that we experience consciousness through? There, there are tools through which consciousness experiences and affects the world that we live in. And you know, we have always, through the ages, had a belief as human beings in invisible entities, in consciousness that doesn't inhabit a physical body, whether that's ghosts or angels or elves. That's always been part of our headset, this acceptance that 
consciousness can exist in other places. And that is, you know, whether that's mountains or volcanoes or thunder clouds, it was always recognized by earlier, earlier civilizations that it was out there. And in our brains and in human beings, whichever school of thought you take, our consciousness is invisible. It's an it's it's electromagnetic phenomenon, it's an energy field, and even if it's just the neurons sparking in our brain, and when they start sparking everything is, is over, it's still a field, it's an energy field, it's not a physical hard part of our being. When that energy field leaves us, all those clever neurons in our brain are they're just worm food. And um, because that is what gives us life. And when you look at the sun, the sun is nothing if not a massive energy field. The sun is devoted to creating its energy field, it sends its energy field out throughout the solar system. And we view it, and we, you know, the scientists, scientists view it as the most mysterious part of the sun, and yet they credit it with controlling much of the sun's behavior. Um, and the sun, it's just you know, it's the most important thing in our lives, or none. I mean, none of us would be, we wouldn't have a place to be without the sun. We would have no life without the sun. Everything, everything we eat is sunlight that has been condensed, which we'll come into when I get to the, um, talk about light. And it's, it's 150 million kilometers away from us. And if you added up all the weight in the solar system, everything in the solar system, the, the sun is 98% of the solar system. Most of the other 2% is Jupiter. And in the center of the sun is the, the core, which is a sort of incredible nuclear reaction going on as hydrogen is being converted into helium in this reaction. And it's a 15 million degrees, and every second, of this reaction, five million tons of the sun's mass is turned into energy, according to Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared. Now, the, the nuclear bomb that landed on Hiroshima, the equivalent of a 1p piece was converted to energy. Now, this is five million tons every second, and that's a huge force. And to contain that force around the sun, around the core, is the radiative zone, that's 315,000 miles, sorry, kilometers deep. It's the, it's the depth of 25 Earths, is this surrounding around that nuclear core. And that is, um, it's the density of gold at the outside. In the core, the sun is 20 times the density of gold. Uh, the radiative zone is, is rotating around this, containing it, and the light, the photons that come out of the sun travel into the radiative zone and they start off as gamma radiation which is deadly deadly energy and they bounce around traveling at the speed of light it would take them just over a second to get through the through the radiative zone but they're not traveling they're, they're not going in a straight line they're bouncing through all the other particles in there and it actually is estimated to take them a million years before the light that's produced in the core actually comes out of the radiative zone in this amazing little trip it's doing. I don't know what's going on as it says hello to every other particle in that radiative zone on, on the way through. Um, it then comes into a, the next big layer is the convection zone. And I should say that the matter in these zones is not matter as we know it. We tend to think of solid, liquid, and gas as the three states, states of matter. But plasma is the fourth state of matter. And more than 99% of the universe is plasma and in plasma particles of matter don't have that sort of balance of electrons on the outside and protons in the center which give them stability they've got missing electrons on the outside so they're constantly conducting charges and energy and if you've ever seen a plasma ball where you put your fingers on the top of it and all those cute little things move around that's plasma and it's um it's a very different state, and the sun is plasma. But back to these little photons, they've, they've come out of the core, they've gone through the radiator zone, and now they go into the convection zone, which is like a huge, seething, bubbling kettle. But the convection zone, it's 
rotating around the radiator zone at a different speed. So here you've got, you know, you've got three levels of the sun so far, they're very distinct, and they're rotating at different speeds. Now this is all supposed to be inanimate, thoughtless matter. This is an accidental phenomenon that has come together through Newtonian principles, just dumb matter in a, cl a cloud of gas in the universe that has turned into this device that's turning at different speeds, performing different functions, um, light comes through the radiators, sorry, through the convection zone, and the next zone is the photosphere, which is the surface that we see. And that's where you've got the sunspots and the solar flares, all this other action going, and it's actually as relatively as thick as an onion skin, the photosphere. Um, comes out of there, the next layer is this thing called the chromosphere. And that's, now we're outside the surface of the sun, the part you see as the sun is going down, that neat outline on the horizon. And the photosphere, the outer levels are invisible to us, um, except during a total solar eclipse. And in the chromosphere, you've got these sort of huge red needles that are sort of a couple thousand kilometers across, and they're flying up through that zone, and they reach the top, and they come down again, and they lose their energy. They're traveling about the speed of sound. Um, nobody really knows what they're doing. It's covered in sprawling networks of magnetic lines. And there's a layer, be a little layer beyond that, before the chromosphere, before the corona. Now, we've, when we've come from the center of the sun, it's 15 million degrees plus in the center of the sun. By the time we get to the surface, it's 5,800 degrees, so it's cooled down an awful lot. Now we're, it should be getting colder as it goes out into the coldness of space, but it doesn't. It gets hotter and hotter. And by the time we reach the corona, it's up to one or two million degrees again. This is a great mystery for solar scientists to figure out. Um, but the corona is the energy field of the sun. It stretches for another one or two million kilometers into space. So it actually takes up more space, the corona of the sun, than the whole sun itself. And it's this incredible, invisible energy field. And, and in my book, I sort of talk about this, and because you, know, you try and when you're talking about something else, you try and relate it to human beings, and you might talk about the heart of the sun, the, 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 the core of the sun being like our heart. I had a thing in my head about the chromosphere being like its eyes or seeing apparatus. But when you look at the, um, the corona, if you're looking at a conscious sun, it's fair enough to look for a mind on that sun. And if you're looking for a mind of the sun, I don't think you have to look further than this invisible energy field, the corona. And with human beings, we're conscious. Nobody's ever quite developed the, the tools to, to witness our mind. But when you're looking at the sun, you don't really need tools with a, doing a total solar eclipse because you see it there. And what you see is the sort of particles traveling through the corona. They're excited by it and they release an electron. But as the sun is spinning, we're just about finished on the, the, the trip through the sun now, but as it spins, this very thin stream of, of charged particles comes off of the corona. And as the sun's spinning, this creates this spiraling electromagnetic bubble, it's described of, which is called the heliosphere. And this comes out and embraces the entire solar system. It stops a few light minutes past Pluto. And you've got this extended corona, extended electromagnetic field of the sun, it holds the entire solar system in its little bubble and it stops cosmic rays from coming through. And cosmic rays are really high energy particles that destroy things and smash into things, whether it's human beings or mountains, that they hit. So we're all protected by this wonderful little heliosphere. And this is still thought by solar scientists to be an accidental phenomenon that just happened to self-assemble out of clouds of cosmic dust, which is, I don't know how they can look you straight in the face and say such a thing, but that's what they do. It's the most important missing piece in the jigsaw puzzle that we have of our cosmos, because it's, it's there, it's the source of our life, it's the source of energy, it's our source of light. And when we don't put this most important character into the story that we're looking at, it's really hard to expect that we're ever going to figure out what the plot is. But, you know, even when we look at the Gaia as a conscious Earth, we look at a conscious universe, 
this is our source of life. This is what enables us to be here. This is what enables me to raise my hand up and gives me that, that actual energy. Um, and we still have this old Christian ethos in play, even though we're not all going to church anymore and Christianity appears to be in decline, we've got this whole be frightened of sunlight propaganda that comes through to us and you, you know don't go out in the sun don't look at it it'll blind you put creams on your body absorb all these chemicals to stop you from absorbing the most healing light the healing vibrations there are um, there's a lot of tradition of using the sun in healing and medicine and in many parts of the world and they used to design hospitals specifically to let sunlight through. They had special glass that would let the ultraviolet rays go in and they put patients out for increasing amounts of time in the sunlight to heal themselves. They knew about the value of sunlight to, to sterilize hospitals, to stop MRSA and other horrible germs and pathogens from existing. This was well-known technology in the 20s and 30s. And then Lo and behold, they discovered antibiotics. And antibiotics was the answer. You know, you just give them patient in, patient out. You didn't have to worry about one or two weeks of healing process and sitting in the sunlight and getting your body. Well, you just gave people antibiotics and that sorted the problem out. So you could have dark, dingy hospitals and it didn't matter anymore. And, um, now we're sort of antibiotics are, are working less and less and it's well maybe let's look at the sun again and the other one with sunlight is this um you know with our eyes we're taught to protect our eyes from ultraviolet radiation well what happens when ultraviolet radiation hits our skin is the body has a response which is it produces a stuff called melanin and melanin stops your skin from burning badly and it helps it absorb sunlight better, more efficiently. When we, but this is all happening in the eyes. The eyes are our meter for reading light. So when we block ultraviolet radiation from coming through our eyes with these protective sunglasses, our body doesn't know what to do. It doesn't realize what's happening. It's not gonna produce the melanin that's gonna protect your skin. And you're gonna be more likely to get skin cancer because you've lost your natural protection to it. So these people lying out in the sun, in their bathing suits with their sunglasses on are really, well they probably do need to smear toxic chemicals all over their skin to protect themselves from it because um, their body's not doing anything. Um, so I kind of wonder sometimes whether all this sort of be frightened of the su sun stuff is just the marketing ploy of people who want to sell more sunblock and sell more sunglasses and sometimes I wonder if there's a sort of a dark plot at hand by you know the dark forces that, that don't want us to recognize the sun because it really is this demonization of the most wonderful thing in our lives that just keeps going on um, so you know when you put the put the sun into the picture and you then look at the consequences of the implications of a conscious sun in our world you really it takes you to to recognize a universe in a world that is organizing universally from the bottom up and not the top down. And you get rid of this funny idea of the, uh, a universal God character who's actually planning everything and setting it up. Because that's not how the universe works. That's not how, no, nobody was taking this cloud of hydrogen gas in, in primeval space and arranging each atom and saying this atom's going to go here, this atom's going to go there, and we're going to sort of put it all into uh, have an explosion in the center, then we'll put something around the, uh, around the side of it. This is what matter does. Matter does self-organize, whether it's in a weather system or whether it's a cloud that's forming a star. These same principles are at play. And um, if you're going back to the Big Bang and you, you it's inconceivable, you know, inconceivable that matter came before energy because energy doesn't need a place to be it doesn't need space it's just a vibration and matter does it has to have all of that and if you postulate that it was energy that was materializing as matter 
at the beginning of time, if there was a beginning of time, then what you have is the first thing this matter does is it self-assembles into a device that does what? That creates energy. So you've got sort of energy creating matter, or that matter creates energy, and the stars are the transmutation machines of the cosmos. It all started off with just helium, with just hydrogen. And in the furnace of a star, all the other elements of the periodic table are created. Everything that enables us to be the complex beings that we are, that enables other worlds to exist. Um, and you do, you get this sort of amazing world that organizes itself or that actually organizes its own deity. I mean, we are a consciousness and that, that is somehow involved with the hundreds of millions of neurons that we have in our brain. And all those neurons are sending electromagnetic signals out that are picked up by other neurons around. And one neuron will have sort of five or 10,000 connections to other neurons in our brain. And we look at a galaxy and it's got a few hundred million stars in it. And they're all sending electromagnetic signals out into space, which are being picked up by other stars around there. It's like a galactic processor that is actually going on up there. And uh, don't ask me what galaxies think about, but I, I posted that on a um, um, author of the month on Graham Hancock's uh, website this month. And I posted the sort of what the galaxies think as a, um, well, I'm not actually asking what they think, but, but as the title for this question, this, this story about thinking galaxies. And um, it's just taken off. There's sort of 130 posts to it so far last time I looked. Um, and all, so, where are we now? We're talking about light still. Um, photons is obviously the essential energy of the universe. And, they found out a while ago that every cell in our body releases photons. And they believe, well not every cell, red blood cells don't let out photons. And since red blood cells are the only cell that doesn't have DNA in it, it's thought that DNA is producing photons, and possibly it's a means of communication to other cells. And plants are doing this as well. Plants are emitting photons. And there's been experiments done um, Secret Life of Plants talks about some of them that actually pick up responses from plants to people's emotions. So people have a relationship with their plants, and this particular guy, so Sylvain, who was doing it, he was damaging himself. He would sort of burn himself or stick, hurt himself somehow, and then he'd check all this is check all of his plants, and he'd see them responding to it. Um, then after a few weeks of doing this, he had a bright idea and he said, well, maybe I'll see if they respond to pleasure because this is getting painful, all this shit. <laughs> and um, so he set up this, this experiment where he went with his girlfriend. Well, he did sort of certain pleasure things that wasn't conclusive. So then he went 80 miles away with his girlfriend to rent a hotel room, had his plants wired up and for, for, to see if they responded to sex. And they did, they really sort of jumped, jumped on the needle when he was having an when they were having orgasm and he sort of clocked that um and then he thought well how can i market this and his idea for marketing it was to sort of for jealous housewives to um they could wire up their begonia by the bedside to be a secret agent and, uh, <laughs> but i don't know if he ever really took that to the market um but now light i'm just going to read you um the beginning of my first paragraph of my chapter on light because it is an amazing thing and it's the um, it's the main product of our Sun that we receive um, I mean we get visible light we get ultraviolet light and we get infrared coming to earth and as you as you probably know in visible light is just this tiny bit the light spectrum is like that and visible light is just a little bit of it uh, infrared light is about 10 times the width of visible ultraviolet light is about six times the, the band of visible light. It's a tiny bit that we get. Um, well, contradicting myself here because I'm talking about visible light versus invisible light, but in fact all, all light, including visible light, is invisible, which we'll come to. But this is the beginning of my chapter, In the Light of Intelligence on the Intelligence in Light. 
I'll come back in a second and pick this apart, but this is the paragraph. Light is invisible, yet it allows us to see. Light hurtles through space for years, yet loses none of its energy in the process. Light can be reduced to a single irreducible photon. And this photon can be in two places at once. We must wait eight minutes for light to arrive from the sun. So. But the light itself arrives in no time at all. Light gives substance and form to the vegetable world, yet itself has no physical property or structure. Light is a mystery and becomes even more so as science discovers ever more of its properties. That's the beginning. Now, light is invisible, yet it allows us to see. When you look out at the night sky on a dark night, you see nothing out there except the stars and the planets. Stars are generating their own light, that's why we see them. Planets we see because the light of the sun is streaming through that whole space area. We can't see it here because we're, you know, it's, it's hitting the other side of the planet at that point. But it's streaming through space and it's completely invisible and dark to us until it hits something. And then we see that thing. And that's thanks to the light. Um, it hurtles through space for years, yet loses none of its energy in the process. And that's the light that leaves a distant star, however many light years away it is, has been traveling for, for say, five years to reach us. And when that light lands at the back of your eyeball and is absorbed into your body, it's got all the same strength. It's the same photon that left that star years before. And you know, how does something do that without losing its energy? Light isn't light can do that. Light can be reduced to a single irreducible particle, the photon, and this photon can be in two places at once. Well, that's an experiment that was done, um, I think it was Elaine Alon who did it, and it was a, it's a two-slit experiment, and they had a sheet with two slits in it, and they were sending photons at it because they wanted to see which slit the photon went through for some reason. And when they did the experiment, the photon went through both slits. I mean, as quantum physicists say, anybody who professes to understand quantum physics doesn't know what they're talking about. It's one of their favorite quips. Um, we must wait eight minutes for light to arrive from the sun's surface, but light itself arrives in no time at all. You're probably all familiar with the science fiction angle on light that if you travel faster than the speed of light you go backwards in time because you're, you're that's a principle and if you're if you're traveling slower than the speed of light as we do you experience time if you actually travel at the speed of light time doesn't exist so for the for the photon there is actually no time it's hard for us to get our heads around but a photon is everywhere at once in its own existence. And it might help to sort of think, to gather that when you hear about people's near-death experiences, when they leave their body, become a being of light, you could say, and their whole life flashes by them in an instant. It might be sequential, but it's this, this common phenomenon where your life flashing by you in an instant. Well. Light lives in its own instant. And maybe we'll all find out what that's like someday, I hope so. Um, but it is, it's mind-bending. And now light gives substance and form to the vegetable world, yet itself has no physical property or structure. Uh, you've heard of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is what creates all the vegetable matter on this planet photosynthesis means made by light. Uh, much of it, two-thirds of it, takes place on the ocean surface where with millions of thousands of plankton in each drop of water take in light and turn it to, to matter, to chlorophyll. Um, and it's, it's actually it's a combination of water, air, and light. That is actually what makes trees. Um, 
we think erroneously that it's sort of, you tend to think it's made out of the earth, out of the soil. But the soil just provides trace elements and nutrients for it. The actual structure is water, air, and light. And the, through photosynthesis, carbon is taken from the CO2 in the air, and hydrogen and oxygen is taken from the H2O in the water. So you've got hydrogen a gas, oxygen a gas, and carbon coming out of carbon dioxide. And that's what makes plants. So the same, those same three ingredients go into make a sesame seed, or an orange, or a tree, or a blade of grass. And um, when you burn any of those things, you burn a, a tree or dried vegetable matter, the ash that's left over at the end when the fire has gone out, that's the portion that came out of the soil. Everything else came out of fire, air, out of light, air, and water, and light, air, and water. Um, and if you want, you know, another, a, 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 if you ever want to ponder a particular mystery, um, try and think how we see. How is it that we get a picture of the world around us through this tiny little hole in the middle of our eyeball, and you get all this, this information out there, and there's just theories on this that, you know, the light bounces against something else, it picks up the color from that product, that item, and brings it to our eyes, but it's, the photon is actually it's leaving something, it, it makes an exchange with every particle that it touches, so when a photon touches a tree, it leaves something with the tree, and it takes some information about that tree with it, and it's sort of informing us about it, it's, a, it's an intelligent phenomenon. And the Zoroastrians, who was the world's first um, first religion to recognize one supreme deity, the first religion to recognize goodness as an actual practice that should be undertaken, they recognized light as the, as the ultimate deity. Ahura Mazda was a god of light, and that was the ultimate force. And the sun they recognize too, because the sun is our local station, it's our local broadcaster of the light force. Um, there are still some Zoroastrians around, they're called Parsis, but they were, they were nearly wiped out by the Muslims, who really wouldn't tolerate this on their turf, and the few remaining Zoroastrians went to India, um, where they found refuge and on the condition that they didn't proselytize, and um, as a result, there's only a few hundred thousand, a couple hundred thousand of them now. When was that? Um, that was in about the around the eighth or ninth century that they had to had to leave Persia. Um, no. So yeah, everything that. Every single cell in our body, every, everything, everything that makes us up, was once part of a star. Except for the actual hydrogen in the water, which is about 10% of our, of our liquid, of the liquid content is hydrogen. Everything else was actually forged on a star. Um, and everything that we eat comes from a star, because photosynthesis concentrates the energy of the sun into plants. And whether that plant is eating, eaten by animals, which then we then eat, or whether it's eaten by us, the plant, all the energy that we are recycling is actually sunlight, which has been stored and is being re-released by us. Whether it's the neurons firing in my brain or my finger pointing to my brain, it's all solar energy um, that is powering us. It's solar energy that's built by us, and yet, most people go through a whole day without even giving a second thought to the sun in the course of it. Um, a situation that we must change. Um, when I took the book into, um, I mean, this is this is the only book that seems to be out there about the sun. And when I took it into 
the Atlantis bookshop near the British Museum, which is the oldest occult bookshop in the old independent occult bookshop in the country. I showed it to the manager as the, the, well, the owner and manager as Geraldine. And she just sort of clasped her hands in joy. And she said, you know, we've got this many books on the moon, and we haven't got a single book on the sun. And um, it's an extraordinary situation. So, what time is it? I haven't spoken nearly an hour yet, have I? An hour, it's 25 minutes. Oh, really? Oh, well, that's good. Because <laughs> I'm coming to an end. <laughs> <laughs> still got some tape left. Still got some tape left. I can end. I could read a chapter out of the book. I read some of a chapter out of the book. Um, this book is on sale here. Um, it's usually 15 pounds. It's on sale here at 10 pounds, and you can have your choice of ink colors so that I sign it in. Um, but have you got any questions, or would you like me to read something from the book? Have we got any feedback here? Yes? Well, in, in the Rig Veda, they sort of, they portray worship as imbuing the qualities of that which you're worshipping. So you're actually sort of getting some of those qualities, some of those vibrations from it, and communing with it. I mean, the Christian worship thing is the prostrating, getting down, oh, I am worthless, you know, thing, and you are everything. But the original term is really just communing, respecting, That's a form of worship, yeah. And it's also, it's good to recognize that it's a two-way experience. I have a chapter in the book which is called Say Hello Back. Because when you're sort of looking at the sun or with your eyes shut, absorbing those vibrations, it's a two-way street. And if, you know, I've quite a build-up to this in the book to explain it, but it was commonly recognized by any solar worshipping and any old solar religions that the sun was an all-seeing eye. Um, I got from Encyclopedia Britannica actually that it's, it's, it's all-seeing and when you look at Christian religion which as we know much of it was an overlay on solar templates um, they see God as all-seeing you know he that created the ear shall he not hear he that created the eye shall he not see. Um, it's not that, to me it's quite sensible to look at the sun and say, well this is the source of light. It gives us the light that enables us to see everything through this miraculous ability of light to spread information around. Uh, maybe the sun has the facility to see as well. Um, and if you're looking at a, if you have a torch and you shine it in your eyes, okay, you're blinded. But you shine it in the darkness at something else, the light that's bouncing off of that comes back through the light that's going out and gives you a completely clear picture of what you were shining it at. Now the sun is like a 360 degree all round torch. It's just sending light out everywhere. Now the light that hits the earth is bouncing back to the sun in the same way that a torch light bounces back to us. And if the sun has the facility of your sight, it's not going to be some little lens stuck somewhere in the middle of a sunspot. It's going to be the whole darn thing. And, you know, if you've got a lens that big, um, you're going to see quite a bit of detail. You can see the Hubble telescope is 2.6 meters wide, and we can see, you know, mountains on Mars and stars in distant galaxies. If you've got a lens the size of the sun, you're going to be able to read the newspaper <laughs> on Earth. Um, and so it's good to sort of, you know, to sort of send messages, send thoughts back, send something back with the light because the sun's saying hello to you when you're taking in it. You're, ta and it's, you're taking in the actual vibrations. It's the vibrations of a living being that is illuminating our world. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> what do we do with your worship? Any other questions? 
say that life just goes on forever and ever and I'm not ever going to stop it. Yeah. If I put my flashlight out in the sky, that light is actually charming for everybody. I believe so, yeah. And it's, it's just a, it's a question of how far away you get. I mean, there are some frogs who, whose eyes are sensitive enough that they could react to one single photon being fired. Um, your flashlight, by the time it gets out very far, you know, you, somebody's going to pick up a photon at some point from it. But it does just go on until it hits something that either absorbs it or absorbs some of its energy. I think I would not like to live in a world where we could understand everything. I mean, it's an exciting thing about being a human being is there's always something, a mystery to explore. There's always going to be something we don't understand, and the further we get into, I mean, the further we, the more we understand about light, the more of a mystery it becomes. And um, I think it's wonderful actually <laughs> to to keep us going. And I mean, I read a book recently on the lost star, which uh, expounds on the effects of our sun's partner star, because most stars are binary, they have a partner and they travel together like, like figure skaters, so they'll sort of spin around each other as they travel through the universe, and, um, or through the galaxy. And it was long thought that the sun doesn't have a partner star to it, but in fact I read a very convincing book that uh, tells me that Sirius, Sirius is that partner star, and that Earth's, the sun's relationship with Sirius has a huge effect upon events on Earth and the progress of, of civilization. Because we have the sort of the procession of the equinoxes, which is a 26,000 year cycle. And it's long been, been acknowledged that we went through four different ages of mankind every procession. And, um, and it's the, it seems to, would seem to be the influence of Sirius, which is our twin star, that has this effect upon the vibrations that are reaching our planet, how long we live, what sort of culture we have. Um, it could be some could have an effect upon the prevalence of indigo children being born at the moment. But the, the influences of stars and planets are, are enormous. And I was giving this talk at the Big Chill and uh, a few few weeks ago, and the very well-known astrologer, Jonathan Kainer, was in the audience. He was actually running the speaking tent. He's the astrologer for the Daily Mail and the most popular astrologer in this country. Um, at the end of my talk, he took the microphone and he said, you know how some people go to parties for the first time and they take some kind of a pill. He doesn't do any of that stuff. They take some kind of a pill and it changes their life forever. He says, well, I just swallowed one of those pills listening to this lecture. And as an astrologer, it had never crossed his mind that maybe stars and planets were living beings, because we never have that stimulus anywhere in our culture. It's just never somebody says, hey, what if? And it just suddenly made so much sense to him that, yeah, that's why they affect us. They're, it's their vibrations, and they've got personalities. And that's going to affect us. And when I had my, I, I opened the world's only shop ever de dedicated to chaos theory back in 1990. And we used to have a salon de chaos, and we'd have eminent scientists and mathematicians coming down once a month and giving little talks. And I remember um, Ian Stewart and his friend were coming down, and they were giving a talk, and there was a book on astrology in our, in our bookshop shelves there. And they just said, oh, what's that? You know, they just completely dis. What have you got a book on astrology about for? It's, it's rubbish. And they were there to talk about things like butterfly wing flaps. You know, that's an okay subject to explore, but not, not things like, you know, the moon and sun affecting little kids. So, no, what else? Any more questions? Yeah. You mentioned vibrations And I merge into.
Yeah, I would agree. I do agree with that. Yeah, I mean, vibration is consciousness in a sense, um, and we don't really know or have tools to measure all the energy and vibrational fields that are out there. And part of that is that science has never really been motivated to study that much detail. They have been motivated to sort of take a piece of our hair out and find out whether we smoked a joint six months ago and come up with these incredible devices for, for various things. But they're not motivated. If, you, if you're a scientist and you say, I want to um, look into morphic resonance, or something that offbeat, nobody's going to give you money or time or place to do it. I mean, Rupert Sheldrake was a rare example of, or he's a rogue scientist who got away with it, but he got a lot of stick for it. But thank God, you know, he got a book out and people read it and it resonated with them. There's so much out there, and I think a god was originally recognized just to be something with a lot more consciousness than us. And if you recognize something that's much more conscious than you are, you sort of say, hey, you know, teach me something. And, um, and that includes the earth, it includes the sun, it includes the planets, and um, you know, it can include your local volcano if you're, uh, if you're living where, near one that's a little bit more powerful than you are. Yes? We are all one. That's absolutely the case, and that's the conclusion that sort of comes through this book and it's not just that we are all one but but how obvious and, and clear it is because we've got on one level in a, in a cell in our human body one single cell has got five to ten million components in it and all of those components are going around they're receiving messages they're sending out messages they're repairing damage, they're taking in nutrition, they're expelling waste. There's a whole process just to keep one little cell going. The DNA in there is 1% of the space. And the rest is all these other geezers. And they're not even organized. They're just bouncing around doing all of this. And you could fit 10,000 of these on the head of a pin. And, and we've got, you know, we've got the, our humanity here and then this planet. Um, it's just one little sort of dot in space, but we're circling our sun, which is one of hundreds of millions of stars in the galaxy, which is one of hun hundreds of billions, which is one of hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe. And it's all, it's all part of this oneness, which is the universal consciousness. And we're all sort of tuned into it. In a sense, our consciousness, you know, we, it's like a, a field, an infinite field, and you can take up as much space in your consciousness as you like, or you can live a really, you know, narrow-minded life, which is concerned with nothing more than what car you drive, and, and what, how much you get paid for work. But that's you know, how much of the field do we want to occupy? And it's um, and it is a universal field. Yeah. Each planet. Yeah. I mean, e each planet is a, is a representative. It's it's. It's part of the part of the solar system family, really, and I'm not sure what what function. Yeah, that's the the as above, so below. No, I think I, I think I think so, and it's interesting. People used to always you know, ascribe personalities and aspects to the planets. Um, I'm sort of going off your question a bit, but. You know, people always realize Jupiter was the king of the planets. And it's not obvious that it's massively bigger than any of the other planets when you're looking at the night sky, but they absorb the light. And I think when we're tuned in to our chakras, to our internal energies, and to external energies, and we're not constantly looking for diversions from that, things are recognized that you know, we're still struggling with and a you know, connection of the planets to our chakras would be one of those really. It's, you know your own vibrations, you know those vibrations, and you know what fits, but we don't even think about vibrations these days. It's kind of a no-no subject. I mean, there's still, science is still trying to diss acupuncture because it relies on energy systems within the body, and that's all bollocks, you know, it's just germs and drugs. 
that's all you need to know and the bit of surgery thrown in. Any more questions? Or? Well, I don't have a question, but I do have, you know, I, when I first heard you written this book, I thought, what well, sun god, that's a bit, bit kind of um, retro, isn't it? <laughs> and then hearing you talk, it's just amazing. I mean, it really has for me, it's like Jonathan said, you know, it took a, a pill that's opened up a whole new way of looking at everything. Yeah. I love it. When I, I first recognized the sun to be a living being in 1966, on my first psychedelic experience in Berkeley, California, and I climbed up to the top of a hill, and I was looking over San Francisco Bay, which is quite beautiful, and, and I looked up to the sun, and I stared into the sun for five or ten minutes without hurting my eyes. And, um, and I realized there was some, somebody, there was a person, there was somebody in residence. But there was something there, it was a living being. And I never really did anything with it, I just sort of carried it around, carried it around, because there's never any stimuli in, in our world to sort of take an idea like that and work with it. And it was just when the SETI project started up in, in 1979, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And then I'd come out, because people would come up to me and say, Hey, Greg, what do you think about this SETI project? And I said, well, you know, it's interesting, but it's being conducted. All this machine, the, the computers, and the technology, and it's being done in complete ignorance of the most intelligent character in the neighborhood, which is right up there. You don't need special tools to see it or detect it. It's there. And yet, you know, we, we're still going around, bumbling around, thinking it's dumb. And, um... And, you know, when I saw sunsets and sunrises, there'd always be this extra dimension to them because I knew the sun was a living being. But I never actually took it anywhere until I started writing my, writing my new book. And I was writing another book. I was writing a book about uh, another subject, which uh, I mentioned it later on in the book what that was. But I got after, after several pages, I got into topic drift. I started talking about sun worship and the consciousness of the sun and I suddenly realized my god this is this is the elephant in the room and I haven't even noticed it but this is the biggest elephant in the room you could possibly imagine it's up there it's every day and and it's a, it's an intuitive natural reaction to it as evinced by by everybody in the um, history of the world prior to prior to Christian influence everybody knew this and yet today we've completely forgotten it and that's my book went in that direction then and um, taking the lid off the biggest cover-up there's ever been every whatever analogies you want to use the Sun is the one that's it thank you very much